Hey, this is Brock Lemires. We're continuing our study of embedded systems design by looking at interrupts. In this video, we are going to look at the specific interrupts that are on our microcontroller, the ones that are on the MSP430 FR2355 launch MCU on the launchpad board. Okay, <clears throat> we are getting very specific. It's now time to talk about exactly what we have and how we can program them, or actually what we can do with these. So our MCU implements 25 unique interrupt vector addresses. That's important. Remember we said that the MSP430 family uh, did 64 different interrupt vectors? We do not have access to all of them. We only get 25 unique vector addresses. This is a very important, important point because you will see that we have peripherals that will share a vector address. <laughs> so you thought it was going to be simple. Nope, it's going to be, <clears throat> it's going to be awesome. <laughs> so we only have 25 unique vector addresses. That means uh, we're not going to write 100 different interrupt service routines. We're only going to write, uh, you know, a handful, right? Okay, so anyway, if, if two or more uh, peripherals share a vector address, you have to actually put code in your interrupt service routine to figure out which one requested the interrupt. And so you actually have to have code at the beginning where you check the flags and say, which one of you raised your flag? Which one of you did this? But luckily, they're, they're not just randomly put together. It's like ports, for example, digital I.O. All port one will have one vector address, but it turns out every bit within port one can generate an interrupt or have, has its own flag. So they're all, they're related, so it's not as difficult as you might think. <clears throat> Remember, all these addresses, they exist within non-volatile memory at the very, very end of our memory range. So they start kind of, you can think of them as starting at FFFF and working backwards, okay? <clears throat> all right, and so let's take a look at them. Let's start from highest to lowest. Number one, first and foremost, the highest priority is reset. When you reset, when, when there is any reset, it doesn't matter if it's you hit the button or you power up or there's a power cycle, your main, the main job of reset is to put the starting address of your program into the program counter. So the highest priority reset is called reset and it exists at address FFFE. And all we need to do is put the address 8000 into that address. We have to do it every single time. Now, it's done for us when we create a CCS project, and it's down at the very bottom, and we'll, we'll see it every time from here on out. Uh, it's been there, and we haven't looked at it, but it does a dot sect reset, or dot reset, and then it does a dot short, and it puts 8,000 in there. Okay, so that's important. Now, this one is a reset, so it doesn't have an interrupt service routine. It, by default, will simply clear every configuration register in the entire MCU, it will flush all the registers in the CPU, <clears throat> and it will then put the starting address of the first instruction in the main program, or, or of your program, into this address. When it fires up, the MCU goes automatically to this address, pulls this address out of it, in our case 8000, puts it in the program counter, and then says, well, let's go. All right, so the reset. No interrupt service routine, but critical that it's initialized. All right, the next two vector addresses are associated with non-maskable interrupts. These are reserved for basically hardware problems, all right? They are non-maskable, meaning you do not have the ability to turn them off, okay? They are always enabled. The first one at FFC, FFFC <clears throat> is for system interrupts. So this is hardware level failures, like memory access, like you try to read from memory or, or, and it's just like goes blank, right? Or timing errors, or you get like a bit error correction code mistake. And so these ones are just like something is totally wrong, but you're gonna give yourself a chance. You're not gonna completely reset. You're gonna take a stab at actually trying to repair it. So you, you could have an interrupt service routine that would do something like go out to a peripheral and try to correct it and try to recover without losing everything before you just say, forget it, it's over, let's reset. Uh, not, uh, let's see, FFFA are the user interrupts, and these are going to be things like external input triggers, oscillator faults. These are also for 
They're for things that are more under the control of the developer, but they're still supposed to be something that's pretty, pretty critical, okay? Now, here is what <clears throat> is unique about non-masculine interrupts. They are enabled, okay? They are enabled. They've been enabled on every program that we've done so far. And you notice that we have not written an interrupt service routine for them. So we have just been going, we have just had our fingers crossed that these one of these hardware failures doesn't happen <laughs> because if it did, it would try to go grab an address, a starting address of an interrupt service routine out of the vector table to go execute it. And that would suck because we didn't initialize it, nor did we write an interrupt service routine. So we have just been hoping that we didn't have a hardware failure and this interrupt did, triggered and then went here, which we didn't initialize and put the program counter into who knows where. And so far we've actually been kind of lucky because those faults haven't occurred. And so this is an interesting thing because for some low, some kind of non-critical applications, like I'm just blinking an LED, it's not the end of the world if, you know, there's a hardware failure. So we have, we, a lot of times you sit there and develop and just, you don't even write interrupt service routines for these non masculine interrupts and you just hope it doesn't happen. And you know what the, the problem is, is a lot of times they don't happen. So this is really a proceed at your own risk. I would say this, for what we're doing, we're just learning about interrupts and it's not a big deal if one of these, we have a failure. In fact, our launch pad board's so inexpensive. If you have a hardware failure, you just throw on the garbage and buy a new one <clears throat> or, or try to fix it. <laughs> but anyway, you have, you know, we've been, we just hope that they don't happen. If you're gonna make a product, you better go and do something with these. Even if it's just telling the MCU to reset itself, you don't wanna have these vectors uninitialized. You never wanna have any, any interrupt have the ability to execute and go try to grab this where you didn't have a service routine. So those two are sitting there kind of interesting. And now we get to the ones where we will spend all of our time, which is the maskable interrupts. You have 22 interrupt vectors that are for the peripherals. These are assigned to eight. You have eight of them for timers. You have one for a real-time clock. You have one for a watchdog timer. We don't even know what these are yet, uh, but I'm just telling you. We have four for serial communication systems, one for the analog to digital converter, one for a comparator, whatever that is, two of them for a smart analog combo DAC. That sounds interesting. And then four for digital IO ports. Okay. And so that's what all these other addresses are. Okay. And you can see that all of them are sitting out there. And now here's what we're going to do. Here's this big table that's in the data sheet. Now this is, this table is, I created this table, but I basically copied and pasted it out of the device specific data sheet. That's important because the MSP430 user family user's guide, it just says, I'm going to give you 64 interrupt vectors but you, it doesn't wire them up for you. It's only when you get down to the specific MCU that you're using is when these actually get assigned to peripherals. <clears throat> and so what I did is I copied out, I copied over all the information, but then I added in a important uh, column called the CCS section. And we'll think about that here in a second, but just take a look at this. You have the vector, you've got kind of the type. So you see your reset, non-maskable, and then everything else is maskable. You have the hard-coded address of, of the vector table of where you'd put the service routine starting address. But then look in here. You actually have uh, you actually have multiple flags that are assigned to a particular vector. And, but they are grouped, right? So for example, you have like a timer. It's it's not just a timer, it's timer zero B3, and there's one interrupt assigned to it, or one flag. It's like, oh, that's easy. But then, of course, here's another one that has, let's see, one, two, three. So you actually have three interrupts, interrupt flags assigned to this vector address. So here, here's how this works. If you only use one of the flags for a certain interrupt, that's fine. You, you don't have to worry too much. But if you, if you enable two of the flags, then you need logic within this, in your service routine to figure out which one actually went. So take a look at this. Here's all your timers. You got your watchdog. You got your real-time counter. Here's all your serial. You got four for the serial, your A to D. And then out the very end, you have your ports, P1 through P4. And they're in order of priority. So this is the highest priority going down, 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 all the way to the lowest priority. Priority doesn't matter much if you don't allow nested interrupts, okay? 
It doesn't matter that much, which we'll never do. Uh, but if you ever do, that gives you the ability to say a higher priority interrupt can, can interrupt a lower priority interrupt. Okay, once, you know, just to reiterate, things are shared. It, the comma denotes when it's a different flag. So notice like in this one, I have something called TB0CCR0 space CCIF G0, whatever that is. We'll figure that out in a different chapter. That's one flag. Okay, and notice down here you have the uh, another flag that's FG1, but then there's a comma. These two words are associated with one flag. Okay, so just because it has a space, that doesn't mean there's two flags in there. It just means that's one flag. Okay, and then down here the comma tells you how many are in there. Down here, look at this one. Holy cow! One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> there's seven flags associated with that one. That's a big dog. Okay. <clears throat> These names mostly, mostly correspond to the names of the registers and bits in the MSP430 data sheet. Now, this is where it gets interesting because the MSP family user's guide is where you have all the configuration register settings. So you are gonna, even though that this, is, this table is specific to the MSP430 FR2355, when you go look at these individual bits and the configuration registers that you're going to alter, it's in the MSP430 user's guide, so the, the monster data sheet. And so most of the time, these labels match. Now, I say most of the time because every once in a while, you'll have something that's just slightly different. So you, the, you always have to go and look it up. Don't just code out of this table. Make sure that you actually go look it up. Okay, these are individual flags. All right, so each one of these, usually the way that it works is the IF stands for interrupt flag, or IFG stands for interrupt flag, and these are the bits, and then this is the register that it exists in. So if I looked at this one, uh, I would say, how do I, how do I look for a flag? We're going to have CC IFG1, and it's in this register, okay? But you got to look up every single one of them, because this is only the flag. You still need to go figure out what is the local interrupt enable. You also have to know how does the peripheral even work? Like, what do I do to set it up? How does it operate? How, what do I need to do to set it up? What's automatic, etc. Okay, section names. This is a biggie, okay? These come out of the, the linker file. And for our version of CCS, this is what we use when we do the directive to say, go to this location in the vector table. So if you do dot sect dot reset, it says, I'm going to go to this address and I'm going to put in memory, put in this, this location, whatever comes next. So this is, this is what we use when we actually code. <clears throat> and I looked these up in a variety of different files, but I know that they work and you'll see that they work. But again, that's where I got these. So this is, this is important because it's, it's like, I want to write a, some code for this interrupt right here, you know, timer zero B3. How do I initialize the vector table? Well, you go down, you do dot sect dot int 42, and then you put dot short, and then you put the address of, or the address label of the interrupt service certificate, okay? All right, that's it. So that is a full overview of the entire interrupt concept and specifically our MCU that we're looking at. So we are getting very close to being able to write a program. All right, that's it. As always, remember to support my channel by subscribing and see you.